Uh, good evening all. Uh, I hope uh, uh, I'm able to uh, be seen and heard. Uh, we are meeting after a long time. So let us start with the uh, very basic uh, subject that is reproductive endocrinology with clinical perspective. Because it is a basic thing. If you know the endocrinology perfectly, just a minute, huh? this is disturbing me. I'm sorry for interruption. So, uh, I think I'm not here. So today, uh, we are going to discuss uh, these many points because the IVF is a subject with a lot of controversies. And not only that, the evidences keep changing. So the conclusion also keep changing. The most relatively constant with the addition of, of course, a newer understandings without creating much controversies is a subject of reproductive endocrinology. So once you master the hormonal play and its interpretation, you can sell through a controversial conclusions and decide about your way of managing the patients. And thereafter, playing and twisting the IVF protocol is easier and without fear. You don't have to ask anybody. If you, are, if you know, the endocrinology properly. Today, we will try to cover the listed points which I found most relevant for practical understanding of endocrinology and its application. You know, whenever many uh, students keep asking, sir, where, from where uh, should I start uh, reading endocrinology? And I keep telling that you should start with the spiro. And once any person who is experienced, if he starts Spiro reading from the page number one, I'm sure he will not be able to reach till 100, page number 100. Because it is so much molecular level and receptor level, the detailed description is there. It is beyond uh, anybody's capacity, especially those who are in clinical practice. So uh, I have selected a 
absolutely applied endocrinology which is absolutely relevant to our day to day art practices so first we will understand and accept certain theories which need to be in your mind all the time you practice art all the follicles are not eager and cooperative to grow the threshold window gets expanded with the hyperstimulation so what is fsh threshold so the pool of enteral follicles they have different sensitivity to fsh depending on their receptor density the follicles which are good of good quality they have got good number of fsh receptors and they have a lower fsh threshold which is quite obviously seen in the younger patients the each follicle have threshold of fsh level selectively beyond which they keep growing till that threshold is maintained those having lower threshold becomes first to grow by mitotic activity and starts secreting estrogen and thereafter estrogen itself is a booster for mitotic activity and granulosa cells maturity and oocyte maturity this threshold window is open till mid follicular phase in the natural cycle this we will see when we will be discussing a natural cycle so the threshold window gets expanded with the hyperstimulation so better to avoid fsh in late follicular phase to stop a new recruitment of the follicles this we have seen many time if we keep stimulating with the higher dose of bonotropin especially at the end of the stimulation it causes a new recruitment of the follicle and this follicles are not going to give a mature oocytes but they are going to add progesterone and which is going to cause embryo endometrial receptivity because of the shifting of receptivity window the another theory is two cell two gonadotropin theory what does that tell the enteral and preenteral follicle the lh receptor we are talking about enteral and preenteral follicle lh receptors are present only on theca cells and fsh receptors are present only in granulosa cells so what happens in response to lh the theca cell produces androgen from the cholesterol and this androgen is diffused into granulosa cell where the fsh induced aromatization converts the androgen to estrogen so there are two cells theca cells and granulosa cells and there are two gonadotropin lh and fsh lh predominantly acts on l theca cell and fsh predominantly in granulosa cells but but according to the recent understanding the lh receptor although less in numbers are present in granulosa cell even in preenteral and enteral follicles so the primary role of lh is production of raw material in theca cell to produce estrogen all throughout the cycle but in addition to it in late follicular phase of the cycle it is capable to carry a forward carry forward as follicular development once lh receptors are developed on granulosa cells under the effect of fsh and estrogen the role of fsh is restricted in the follicular phase in granulosa cells to activate aromatase enzymatic conversion of androgen to estrogen plus mitotic activity in the granulosa cells 
and induction of LH receptor on the granulosa cells. So theca cells are the regular home of LH receptors, whereas granulosa cell is a vacation house where they start occupying in the mid follicular phase and thereafter a play important role in oocyte maturation and steroidogenesis. So if you look at this graph, this diagram, it shows the LH receptors density. The LH receptor, see this is red is FSH receptor and black is a LH receptor. So in the early follicular phase, the, there is a predominantly FSH receptor and very few LH receptor. As the follicle grows, the number of the LH receptors are increasing and around cycle six to seven, when the follicle is around nine millimeter or 10 millimeter, there are more number of LH receptor, uh, there are equal number of LH receptor and FSH receptor. And as the folliculogenesis further advances, there are more of LH receptor and less of FSH receptor. So, uh, if you, this is the same uh, fact has been shown here. In granulosa cell less than five millimeter, there are no LH receptor expression in the granulosa cell. When the, uh, the follicle grows five to 10 millimeter, there is expression of LH receptor, which is observed in the granulosa cells of 80% of the follicle. And in the follicle, when it is more than 10 millimeter, the expression of the LH receptor increases while FSH receptor decreases. May it be a stimulation, ovulation, or luteal phase. We always prefer to mimic natural cycle to augment the success because the nature is the greater and better consultant than us. So we need to touch upon briefly important events which is happening in the natural cycle. So let us look at the folliculogenesis events in the natural cycle. So as we discussed earlier, there is a FSH secretion from the pituitary. This FSH concentration must exceed the follicular threshold. Then and then the follicle recruitment occurs. The duration of the FSH threshold, or you can say window, is limited in early mid follicular phase by increase E2 from the large follicle. So I will explain in little detail. What happens under the FSH secretion at the early part of the follicular genesis in natural cycle, the follicle which is selected, which is the ready to grow and having the highest FSH receptor density and lowest threshold. So this follicle is selected and it start growing and that follicle becomes dominant. And this follicle, once it crosses nine to 10 millimeter, then it starts secreting estrogen. And this estrogen by negative feedback mechanism suppresses the pituitary and pituitary reduces the secretion of FSH. This is how the dominant follicle is selected. And because of the reduction in the FSH, which is secreted from the pituitary, the small follicles, which are having a lower, lower number of the FSH receptor, they undergo atresia. And this is how monofollicular ovulation occurs. So the recruitment process of follicles start well before two months of the index cycle. The follicle with the good number of FSH receptors and ready to go, get selected and keep growing. As it grow, keep producing estrogen and it keep enhancing the mitotic activity of granulosa cells, keep inducing the LH receptor. And after which it requires very less amount of FSH or LH for the further development. I'm talking about the dominant follicle. And as mentioned, rising E2 by negative feedback inhibit the pituitary to secrete FSH. 
So after this sin, the smaller follicles with lower number of FSH receptor cannot sustain growth and undergo atresia. And this is how a monofollicular, which we have already understood. This is my favorite diagram, which guides me in endocrinological play when I'm confused anytime. So this diagram should be registered in your mind perfectly. If you go into the depth on this side, the levels are written. So first, let us start with the FSH. The FSH basal level is around eight units, uh, international unit in serum level. Then gradually it increases. And as the FSH increases, the follicle recruitment starts. And around cycle day six, seven, the estrogen level also start increasing because the follicle, dominant follicle is selected and start secreting the estrogen. Till that, till that, the LH level is at the basal level. Progesterone is also at the basal level. So this is how the early follicle, folliculogenesis is going on. Now what happens? When the estrogen level reaches somewhere around crossing more than 100 picogram, the follicle, which is a dominant follicle, which is harboring oocyte, gives signal that it is ready to, uh, you know, ovulate. And uh, so it gives signal to initiate LS surge. So just before that, the progesterone level, before estrogen surge, before LS surge, the progesterone start increasing. And it is, it is because of the signal given by the oocyte. Following the rise in the progesterone, please understand that progesterone start rising 6 to 12 hours before the LH surge. This is LS surge. So this is very important point to be noted that progesterone start rising even before the estrogen has tipped rise steeply and uh, the, before the LS surge, six to 12 hours before the LS surge. So after this, the LS surge occurs. And if you notice, the, this is a point of LS surge and this red line, this is a estrogen level. So before the LH surge is over, the estrogen starts declining. So if you want to determine the LH surge, this is important point. Not it, not, it is not only decided by the height or the level of the LH surge, but it is decided by the fall in the estrogen level. So once this LH surge occurs, the progesterone start rising exponentially and keep it is it is raised and it is reaching up to 10 nanogram per ml and this remains high for a couple of days and uh, uh, just before uh, maybe you can say mid follicular mid luteal uh, uh, day from there it starts declining because the corpus luteum cannot sustain that activity so the progesterone start falling the estrogen also starts falling. And then again, because of the falling estrogen and progesterone, again, the pituitary is relieved from negative feedback and the FSH and LH, FSH levels start increasing and which is responsible for the new recruitment of the follicle. Too high and too low, both are bad. The high LS level is observed mostly in severe PCOS and low levels observed in hypo-hypo, severe agonist down regulation and the users of OCP in a prolonged fashion. So how 
it is what happens what is lh window so lh level when it is high the lh because of the high lh level there is a hyperandrogenic environment and because of the hyperandrogenic environment there is a follicular atresia the reason we will discuss or what is the mechanism why that happens we will discuss little later high ls level causes premature luteinization and oocyte development is compromised what happens when the ls level is low when the ls level is low there is a low uh, estrogen synthesis there is impaired follicular maturation because it's because of the low lh level the estrogen is uh, suffering and because of the low estrogen level which is a very important for follicular maturation uh, not only follicular maturation the endometrial proliferation is dependent on estrogen and because of that there is a inadequate endometrial proliferation if the lh is normal everything falls into place adequate androgen estrogen biosynthesis normal follicular development and normal oocyte maturation so this diagram after the study of effect of lh activity on e2 level with the roval lower rec lh see this is uh, the 25 unit added this is 75 unit of lh is added and this is 225 unit of lh is needed in hypo hypo so with the 25 there is no almost no difference or little minimal rise of estradiol with the 75 after the cycle day 5 after 5 days of stimulation the estradiol start rising to this level and when it was lh activity was increased to 20 225 there was a further higher level of serum estradiol level was achieved. So that itself suggests a vital role of LH played in estrogen biosynthesis. The secretion of natural hormones from the pituitary and hypothalamus are always pulsatile in nature. And that's the reason why single estimation value is not dependable with lot of variation. So normally, all throughout the cycle, LH in follicular phase and luteal phase almost remain stable. But at mid of cycle, there is a storm and which changes everything in the follicle. Gone is the time when we used to believe that LH surge is initiated by rising level of estrogen. We all believe that estrogen rise beyond 100, 200 picogram is responsible for LS surge by causing positive feedback mechanism. This is the old teaching. The new concept has been changed. The concept has been changed now. Because if estrogen was responsible for LS surge, then all the patients of external estrogen supplemented cycle would face LH surge, but that does not happen. If that was the case, then all control ovarian stimulation cycle, where the estrogen rise quite early in the cycle, would face a premature LH surge early in the cycle only, but that does not happen. So according to the fresh understanding, the progesterone rise only happens when estrogen primed follicle and pituitary is ready to uh, sorry follicle is ready to liberate oocyte so let us see how the progesterone rise occurs so what happens when the follicle is mature we all know psv is increased the more than 75 percent of the follicle the vascularity is increased so there is an excessive vascularization and inflammation of the follicle shortly before the ovulation so according to one theory the follicle is losing integrity there is a change in the intrafollicular hormonal milieu and there is a spontaneous luteinization of part granulosa cells and which is responsible for some release 
of progesterone. And according to another theory, the inflammation which is caused by increased vascularity, there is an increased oxygen Now it is fine, I think. So it is not the persistent rise, but the rise from the steady low level during the follicle phase, which is important. So when the progesterone rise 50% above the average, of the follicular level, then LS surge happens. What is the mechanism? The progesterone acts on progesterone A receptor in the hypothalamus, which has capacity to modulate GnRH pulse. So the FSH and LH surge is initiated. So what are the pre-ovulatory events? Because of the pre-ovulatory LS surge, the major role of LS surge is to stimulate the meiotic maturation, formation of the stigma or the site of follicle rupture. Triggers of ovulation and follicular rupture about 36 hours after the LS surge, there is a disruption of the cumulus oocyte complex and luteinization of the granulosa cells. Not only that, there is a reduction in the gap junction between the cumulus cell and expansion of cumulus. The study on the result of natural cycle frozen embryo transfer has shown the importance of decline of E2, which is more important than the highest peak LH day to determine the day of search. To elaborate it little more, suppose if you want to determine, suppose if you want to, just a minute. So to elaborate uh, more, uh, suppose, uh, if you want to determine the LS surge, then you need to measure serum LH level, you need to measure serum E2 level, and you need to measure serum progesterone level. The day on which the serum LH level is more than 17. Next day also, suppose it is 20. The first day LH more than 17, 
the stadium level was say for example 300 next day ls level 22 and study all level say uh, 200 so there is a fall more than 30 percent of the study level but lh level is high so this high lh level which is 20 should not be a considered as a day of ls surge but lh surge should be considered on the previous day so to make it short and sweet, it is not uh, uh, it, the importance of decline of E2 is more important than the highest peak LH day to determine the day of LS search. So more than 17 plus next day 30% fall in E2 level is a day of LS search. But in practice, it is too tedious, too cumbersome and too expensive to do a, a hormonal test daily. So practically, we, I mean, very few clinics, they meticulously uh, do this testing. The rest, all of us, they go by clinical method, they go by sonographic uh, vascularization index, and then decide about the LS search. So let us summarize the role of LH in various phases of menstrual cycle. So in follicular phase, it promotes androgen secretion from the theca cell, and it is it causes it it has a synergistic action with the FSH in producing estrogen, and it supports the dominance once the FSH levels decreases. In mid cycle, primarily the role in is oocyte meiosis, maturation of the uh, cumulus oocyte complex, follicular rupture, and granulosa utilization. And in luteal phase, the maintenance of the corpus luteum and progesterone secretion, endometrial receptivity and implantation, and recruit a new pool of follicle under the effect of, uh, along with the FSH. So now, in stimulated cycle, the aim is to have more than one follicle. And in hyper stimulated, uh, in stimulated cycle, the aim is to have more than one follicle. And in hyper stimulated cycle, to have multi follicular development. If we wish to have it, we need to satisfy the appetite of multiple follicles in terms of providing them FSH level higher than their individual threshold. So in stimulated cycle, the exogenous FSH exceeds the higher threshold and it extends the window. So there is a multiple follicular recruitment, multiple follicular growth. And this FSH induces LH receptor in the granulosa cells of the follicle more than 10 millimeter of the diameter. And from this point of time, these follicles are equally responsive to FSH as well as LH. The estrogen synthesis enter into fast pace only after follicle reaches 10 millimeter. So many times we get confused, especially in PCOS, when there are multiple small follicles, which are hardly three millimeter, four millimeter, five millimeter. And we all think that we have stimulated for five days, six days, and still the follicles are almost same. Should we start antagonist or not? So the answer is, a very small follicle hardly secretes any estrogen. The estrogen secretion starts only and only once the follicle are around 9 to 10 millimeter. And once the, if the estrogen levels are inadequate, the follicles are small, the chances of LH surge are 
minimum. That is why you should not make haste in starting antagonist. If you want to start antagonist, you can start antagonist right from the beginning when you are suspecting a raised basal LS level. And because of that, the follicle recruitment is not happening. So with that idea, if you want to start antagonist, you can start. And if you start antagonist in such scenario, definitely within two or three days, the follicle recruitment starts. So rapidly rising E2 at play two and progesterone elevation from basal level initiates the FSH and LSH we have already seen. The duration and rate of E2 rise important for LS search. And not only this, a lot of autocrine and paracrine system has some role in the ovulation. So if you ask me, adding LH activity cause increase or decrease in the progesterone synthesis? Very crucial question. My answer will be, I do not know exactly. The available literature is also confused over this aspect. Still more confusing is SCG driven LH activity is better or recombinant LH driven LH activity is better as far as the prevention of progesterone elevation in the late follicular phase is concerned. The LH plays dual role in progesterone synthesis and conversion to metabolites having androgenic activity. So let us go into little depth and which is absolutely necessary if you really want to understand the LH effect of LH on the progesterone. So the LH acts on theca cell receptors to stimulate cytochrome P450 CYP17 enzymatic complex, which is responsible for conversion of progesterone by D4 delta 4 pathway or pregnenolone delta 5 pathway to 17 hydroxylated products and androgen. The actual resulting effect is decreasing in the progesterone production by theca cell. So if somebody asks how LH reduces the progesterone in the theca cell, it is through CYP17 enzymatic pathway, which converts pregnenolone and progesterone to androgen. Now what happens? This androgen is infused uh, into the granulosa cells and where under aromatized enzymatic conversion, it is converted into estrogen and that is how estrogen level increase. So this is fine, simple to understand. What is more, little more confusing is LH also acts on 3B hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase that is HSD path, type 2 pathway to stimulate the conversion of pregnenolone to progesterone. So by another mechanism of action through HSD pathway, it converts pregnenolone to progesterone. Therefore, the progesterone level is increased. So by one pathway, it reduces the progesterone level. By another pathway, it increases the progesterone level. Therefore, the overall effect of LH on theca cell progesterone production is depends on balance between these two enzymatic activity. The LH acts on granulosa cell where LH receptor have been induced by FSH at the later stage of follicular phase. In vitro experiment have clearly demonstrated that LH has a synergistic effect with FSH on granulosa cells to stimulate progesterone production. And that LH is far more potent. Please remember, please remember these sentences. The LH has a synergistic effect with FSH on granulosa cells to stimulate progesterone production. And this LH is far more potent than FSH on granulosa cells to produce steroid 
as access, assessed by cyclic AMP accumulation. So still more, uh, so, uh, so uh, we must understand that the L, once the LH receptors are induced in granulosa cell, granulosa cell scales up. The progesterone production is scaling up after addition of LH receptor. And so that, so the follicles which are mature secretes more and more progesterone. And this progesterone, if it is excess, the only way of reduction in the progesterone is CYP17 pathway in the theca cell. And it has rate limiting or there is a limit beyond which it cannot convert this progesterone, profuse progesterone, which is coming from granulosa cell compartment to theca cell. And ultimately, this progesterone is released in the circulation and which is responsible for progesterone elevation in the late follicular phase or the, on the day of trigger. So LH play a key role in steroidogenesis and final follicular maturation. This is a repetition of the previous fact which we have seen. So if you recollect the second slide about the role of LH in steroidogenesis, you will be enlightened to know that adding LH activity in the later half of the cycle is double aged SWOT, as the progesterone synthesis is in full form in granulosa cells, and LH addition may take it to the next level. But, but if the LH was added right from the beginning, the thicker cell will start overworking with CYP17 enzymatic process to convert this progesterone to endosterone, and the, there will not be any uh, progesterone uh, backlog in the theca cell compartment. So the sweet point theory strongly recommends that to prevent a progesterone elevation, the ratio of FSH, LH to FSH, to be kept between 0.3 and 0.6. And this 0.3 and 0.6 is called sweet point. And this holds true for all spectrums of the patient and all protocol. May it be PCOS, may it be poor responder, may it be antagonist protocol, may it be long agonist protocol. Extreme deviation further from sweet point were at greater risk of progesterone elevation, which was more pronounced in lower ratio rather than higher ratio. So if you add more LH activity, then probably it does not harm too much, provided if you have, you have added right from the beginning. But if the LH activity was on the lower side, the progesterone elevation is bound to occur. Now, what do you mean by LH activity? So, 75 units of highly purified HMG, which comprises of 75 units of FSH activity and 75 units of LH activity. Now, while purification process, the LH activity is destroyed, LH activity is destroyed. So, to compensate this destroyed LH activity, commercially, we are adding nine units of SCGM, the, 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 the manufacturer unit, they add nine units of SCG, which is equivalent to 75 units of LH activity. So all HP, HMG are having LH activity, which is derived from SCG, a very well-known multinational company which keep misguiding 
all of us that their product is the only HMG which has got SCG driven LH activity, which is not true. All HP HMG, their LH activity is LH, uh, SCG driven only. Now, what is the source of SCG? The source of SCG can be either central or chorionic origin. The chorionic origin SCG has been found more close to hyperglycosylated SCG, which is the earliest SCG, which is secreted by cytotrophoblast and which is responsible and playing a very vital and crucial role after implantation has occurred in chorionic differentiation and tissue remodeling, including angiogenesis. So now, what are the LH levels in natural, if you compare natural cycle with the stimulated cycle? So in antagonist cycle, the LH level is, see, this is, this is an antagonist cycle, blue is, and this is a natural cycle. So in antagonist, the LH level is same like natural cycle in the early follicular phase, but after starting the antagonist, because here is the stimulation day six, five or six or seven, here, after stopping, starting the antagonist, the LH level sharply falls, but still it remains higher than long agonist protocol. Hmm? So, it is not mandatory to switch over to HMG once you start antagonist. But practically, I do that to cut down the cost of the cycle. There is no other reason. Otherwise, you can definitely continue whatever you have started with the right from the initial part of the stimulation. If you are, if you do not intend to transfer fresh embryos, because if you stimulate, which, which we have seen earlier, if you stimulate without any LH activity, there are very high chances of progesterone elevation in the late follicular phase. In agonist cycle, the down regulation becomes profound as days progresses and LH level remains around a bare minimum. In hypo hypo, the LH level is below minimum level. And that is the reason in hypo hypo, the LH activity is absolute, absolute, absolute mandatory. Without that, the follicular genesis is not going to happen. So you will feel happy if I say that 1% of the LH receptors, only 1% of the LH receptors are required to be occupied for steroidogenic activity, which is normally sufficient even after the long down regulation. So what is that level, minimum level? Different studies, 0.5 unit, 0.8 units, 1 unit. I believe less than 0.8 unit is not sufficient. But you must understand the LH threshold under which the tyrodogenesis and folliculogenesis affected cannot be assessed by a standard plasma LH concentration because biological activity, it does not measure the biological activity. It is just measure the serum level. So biological activity may not go, may not be going parallel to the serum level. But one interesting study has concluded that when LH level was less, when LH activity was absent and it was stimulated only with the FSH, there was less E2, the oocytes and number of the embryos were affected but blast development was not affected. Now, this is just a conclusion. The explanation was not given. Reason, I do not know. So here is the interesting study, which is comparing the effect of FSH only with suboptimal LH level. FSH only with normal LH level, See, this is a blue 
FSH only with low LH level. This is FSH only with uh, uh, normal, F normal LH level. And this is SCG added LH activity when there was a LH level was suboptimal. Only LH level was less than 0 0.5 in it. So if you observe the implantation rate and live birth rate was higher when SCG was added, even when the LH activity was less, and which was implantation and pregnancy rate was higher than the FSH stimulation with normal LH level. FSH stimulation with normal LH level. So definitely it uh, proves the tremendous role of SCG driven LH activity. Now you have, we have understood the necessity of LH in stimulation. Now let us see the ill effects of excess LH by causing hyperandrogenism. So the high endogenous LH, first of all, clinically it increases the miscarriage and infertility by affecting endometrium. Not only it affects endometrium, it increases the ovarian androgen production. And these androgens, because of the uh, very high production, it is convert, those androgens are converted into more potent 5-alpha reduced form, which cannot be aromatized to estrogen. This reduced form cannot be aromatized. So ultimately, there is a collection uh, of androgen in the follicle hyperandrogenic environment. And this uh, androgen inhibits the FSH-induced LH receptor on the granulosa, which inhibits the progressive follicular development and causes atresia. Because if the LH receptors are not induced, the steroidogenic activity, estrogen biosynthesis, or granulosa mitosis, everything is affected. So it causes atresia. The androgens at uh, uh, liver inhibits the sex hormone binding globulin production. And sex hormone binding globulin is important in reduction in the androgen from the uh, circulation. So because of the inhibition of this enzymatic uh, enzyme, it leads to an increased circulatory androgen and which further increases the insulin resistance. The increased circulatory androgens decreases the sensitivity to estrogen and progesterone feedback mechanism. And hyperandrogenemia induces abnormalities in the feedback control of pulsatile GnRH, resulting increased LS secretion, which further stimulates the ovarian androgen production. So it's a viscous cycle. So these are, in nutshell, the effects of hyperandrogenic environment in the follicle. After understanding the ill effects of hyperandrogenism, especially in PCOS, let us understand other hormonal problem in PCOS. So what is the relation of LH with AMH? The LH increases the AMH production four folds in granulosa cells of the PCOS ovaries. And that is the reason LH and AMH goes hand in hand. The raised LH increases the AMH expression in anovulatory PCOS, but not in the ovulatory PCOS. So there is a partiality of LH and AMH on ovulatory PCOS. So that is the reason why ovulatory PCOS are more friendly than no, uh, and no military PCOS. The raised LH down regulates the MH, AMH receptor 2 expression in the granulosa cells of the ovulatory PCOS, but no effect on the anovulatory PCOS. So it is very interesting to note that the effect of LH and interrelation of AMH is different in ovulatory PCOS and anovulatory PCOS. What is the relation of insulin and AMH? 
Again, insulin and AMH also commonly associated and goes hand in hand. For all practical purposes, the insulin should be considered as a co-gonadotropin or you can say LH only for all practical purposes. So insulin increases the androgen production in PCOS by acting as a co-gonadotropin with LH activity in the theca cell. The insulin increases the AMS secretion in non-PCOS by its abnormal effect. I do not know what is the significance of, I mean, what is uh, understanding behind this statement, but I have written. Now, after understanding the, uh, uh, the hormonal problem, now let us uh, understand how the aromatase enzyme uh, hormonal changes occurs after, in, after ingestion of the aromatase enzyme inhibitor. So it is used for ovarian stimulation to avoid supraphysiological estrogen and other compounds. Inhibition, it causes inhibition of the aromatization and it will block the estrogen production from the all sources in the body. It releases the hypothalamic pituitary axis from estrogenic negative feedback without depletion of estrogen receptor. So there is no depletion of the estrogen receptor. I think we all know. So let us uh, rush through uh, this. Uh, so uh, there is a robust release of FSH and subsequent follicle stimulation. The risk of the OHS is minimized. Uh, there is an increase in intraovarian androgen, which increases the sensitivity to FSH. Not only this, it is important to note why aromatase enzyme inhibitor scores over sclomiphene. Not only by uh, uh, not, not only the endometrium level, but it increases the IGF-1 synthesis and it upregulates the estrogen receptor in the endometrium. It upregulates the integrin and hoxa uh, uh, receptor genes receptor, which are responsible for the implantation. So letrozole has got direct effect on the endometrium and increases the receptivity. What about the clomiphene? Not to forget the age-old clomiphene, which is a marvelous molecule if you minus the endometrial side effect. It is both estrogen agonist and antagonist property. Enclomiphene is more potent. Levels rise rapidly and eliminated quickly. Zooisomer may remain detectable for more than one month. It binds the estrogen receptor throughout the body, depletes the estrogen receptor concentration and prevents uh, prevents the correct interpretation interpretation of the circulating estrogen in the hypothalamus and pituitary. It makes the pituitary and hypothalamus blind to the estrogen level. So pituitary thinks that there is no estrogen, so it keeps uh, bombarding uh, the FSH secretion. There is a reduced negative feedback and there is a supraphysiological level of estrogen uh, uh, happens. And FSH window is extended and that's the reason why multiple follicle grows with the clomiphene, not uh, commonly with the letrozole. It scores over the letrozole for multifollicular development. And one more uh, fact which I like about clomiphene is prevention of premature LS surge reasonably, which is less likely before five days of last peel of clomiphene. So if you have given clomiphene for say example, from day three to day uh, seven, then the uh, LS surge is less likely to occur before day 12. So you are comfortable till day 12. You can keep uh, giving uh, gonadotropin if you wish. Uh, after uh, day 12 only, you should be conscious about the premature LS search if there is there was a multifollicular development. Now, after uh, looking at the uh, letrozole and clomiphene, let us understand the agonist action. The agonists are GnRH analog, 
with actions similar to GNRH with a longer half-life. Their primary role is to keep check on the premature ALS surge from the pituitary. There are three molecules which are commonly available in India, luprolide, tuptoralin, and bisorolin. The single injection of agonist that binds with the receptor, GNRH receptor, for about 12 hours. It causes initial flare of the pituitary. The effect is more on LA, uh, the effect on LH is more than FSH, and which lasts for three to six days. Each and every sentence are worth remembering all the time. There is a flare for three to six days. The effect is more on LH than FSH. Following this flare. The, there is a down regulation of the pituitary. Again, the down regulation effect is more on LH than FSH. And this suppression continues after stopping agonist minimum for nine days, and it has been noticed up to six weeks. The agonist has got higher affinity towards GNRH receptor. So it can replace the antagonist, which are already bound to a GNRH receptor easily. And that is the reason why agonist trigger can be easily given in antagonist cycle without any problem. But in long agonist protocol, the agonist trigger cannot be used because those receptors are already occupied and there is a depletion of LH in the, at the hypothalamic and pitch, uh, at the pituitary level. The agonist has direct positive stimulatory action on the ovarian follicle granulosa cells. So this is the reason why practically many centers keep adding agonist in the luteal phase because it has got direct stimulatory action, not only on the ovarian follicle granulosa cells, but uh, LH driven, it acts on uh, endometrium also. So the implantation is better. So we also have started adding single injection of agonist. The next day of transfer, in, even in the FET cycle, so what is the efficacy? The efficacy of the luprolide 1 milligram is equivalent to bisorelin 0.5 milligram, which is equivalent to triptorelin 0.5 milligram, uh, 0.1 milligram. The antagonists are the type of GNRS analog, which are becoming popular for prompt suppressive action on the pituitary. It causes quick, reversible suppression of pituitary within eight hours only. The biological half-life is around 20 hours. So after that, the LH can rise. And that is the reason you have to make sure that the duration between last dose of antagonist and trigger should be less than uh, more than eight hours, but less than 20 hours. The antagonist effect is more on LH, less on FSH. What is the criteria to start antagonist? If the E2 is less than 300 picogram, the onset can be delayed, but undue delay. So what is the ideal day of starting antagonist? Stimulation day seven, lead follicle, more than 15 millimeter, E2 more than 1000. That is called undue delay. What is the ideal? The stimulation day seven, lead follicle 14 millimeter, and E2 around 400 picogram. It is the ideal uh, time to start uh, antagonist. Now, there are a couple of studies which has suggested that the ideal time to start antagonist is when the E2 level between 500 and 1000, that gives the best result. So more and more studies are 
and more and more centers, including our center, have started believing in little late start of antagonist. Because it has been observed uh, in the cycles where there is a premature LS surge, which happens quite early, even before the starting of the starting point of the antagonist. So really does not matter much if you start antagonist little late. And even in those finding original study in 27% of the, uh, the cycles, the criteria to start antagonist were made only after stimulation day seven. So it is perfectly safe to delay a starting antagonist either on stimulation day six or seven and or the lead follicle reaches 14 millimeter, whichever comes earlier. There is no need to increase the dose of gonotropin after starting antagonist. There may be a fall or PLE2 or increase of E2 level on the day of starting the antagonist. It's not certain. There may be fall, there may be increase, or there may be there may be a PLE2. Now, the the hormone which is quite uh, you know we all are fascinated with this hormone. The MH is gaining popularity because of its reliability in predicting the response to the stimulation. So what is the action of AMH? The AMH acts as a follicular gatekeeper who is lenient for endovelatory PCOS. Again, the AMH is lenient for endovelatory PCOS. So endovelatory PCOS, uh, 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 the AMH is quite lenient. So at suitable time, there is a, that inhibition is broken and there is a massive uh, growth of the multiple multiple follicles and there are more chances of OHSS. It inhibits the FSH independent primordial follicular recruitment. So it's a gatekeeper. It exhibits less inhibition in endovelatory PCOS leading to increased early follicular genesis and accumulation of the preenteral and small enteral follicles, which results in AMH overproduction in a vicious cycle. So in severe PCOS, why there are more number of smaller and smaller follicle? Because this gatekeeper is lenient. So it allows a limited growth of the follicle. And this follicle again secretes AMH. So again, the AMH level is increased. So there is a vicious cycle. It inhibits the FSH dependent follicular maturation, which happens when the follicle crosses four millimeter by decreasing the follicular sensitivity to FSH. So it is FSH ka dusman. It reduces the sensitivity of the FSH. It inhibits the FSH induced aromatize, uh, aromatization in the granulosa cells, thereby reducing the conversion of the androgen to estrogen. So in, it increases the intrafollicular androgens which in vicious cycle increases the induction of growth of the again smaller FSH independent follicle and which again results further increase in the FSH production. See, please try to understand. The androgens are responsible for FSH independent follicular growth. And once this follicle grow little bit and becomes a follicular FSH dependent, it also secrete AMH. And this AMH again increases the androgen level. Again, this androgen uh, helps in recruitment of the further follicles. So it's a vicious cycle. So if you really want a smooth uh, going follicular stimulation, you need to uh, keep check on AMH and its resultant hormonal play. So how AMH is downregulated with the follicular growth? Increasing FSH level, either endogenous or exogenous, and estrogen production. Now they are overpowering. They are now dominating over the AMH once the follicle uh, crosses four to six millimeter. 
for, because then AMH receptors are decreasing. From growing follicle, it down regulates the expression of AMH and AMH receptor 2 messenger RNA during differentiation of small enteral follicle to large enteral follicle. Now game is changed when the follicle has grown beyond 4 to 5 millimeter. Now the crucial question, why AMH is elevated in the PCOS? Because the granulosus cells of the PCOS ovaries have increased expression of AMH messenger RNA from birth, which increases production of AMH in the follicle cohort size 2 to 5 millimeter. The PCOS ovary with the predominant 2 to 5 millimeter size follicle populations are likely to have raised AMH and they are mostly anovulatory. And what is the role of androgen in the PCOS, the AMH production? The, it stimulates the FSH independent small pre enter follicular growth, which produces AMH due to higher expression of AMH messenger RNA. So all goes hand in hand. Uh, especially in PCOS, how obesity affects. There are more in obesity, there is more. Uh, intraperitoneal fat, which is normally metabolically active fat. So there is more lipolysis keep happening, more free fatty acids. And because of this more fatty, free fatty acids available, there are more androgen formation. And another reason, the free fat is uh, uh, inflammatory. The inflammatory markers are more, cytokines are more. So that increases the insulin resistance. So in obese patient, there is more androgen and there is increased insulin resistance. What is effect of hyperandrogenism in PCOS? Because of the hyperandrogenism, there is a increased insulin resistance and the androgen is more androgen. They are converted into potent 5-alpha uh, forms where aromatization is not possible and it causes atresia, which we have already discussed. Causes of hyperandrogenism, the insulin resistance, because of the insulin uh, uh, resistance, there is insulin, causes of insulin resistance is hydrolysis of the fat, free fatty acid, and androgen production. So there is insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, action on LH and theca cell, it in, increases, acts as a cogonotropin and increases androgen production. And third is it causes hyperthicosis. So there is an overexpression of LH receptor. And fourth is inhibition of the sex hormone binding globulin. So that increases the circulatory androgens. So why there is an increased insulin resistance? There is a dysfunction in, in associated of phosphoglycans. Because of the obesity, there is a cytokines which increases insulin resistance and hyperandrogenism that also increases the insulin resistance. Why there is a low or normal FSH in PCOS? Because a lot of small follicles keep producing estrone and which causes a negative feedback. And second, there is increased inhibin B from the small follicles which, which keep check or causing negative feedback on the pituitary. So there is a low level of FSH in PCOS. Why that is a raised LH level? This is because of the increased LH pulse following increased GnRH pulse circulatory pulse. And second, because of the circulatory androgens. And third, there is anovulation in the PCOS. So there is a lack of progesterone and that does not cause negative uh, effect on the pituitary, so LH is not kept at the check, kept at the check. So let us understand the difference between natural LS surge, the LS surge following agonist trigger, and SCG level after SCG trigger. So if you observe the LS surge after GnRH, first let us see natural. The natural L rise in LH is 14 hours, play to 14 hours and fall another take 20 hours. So 20, 14, 14, 28 and uh, so almost 48 hours, the LH surge remains. LH surge is for 48 hours, LH activity. 
what happens is GA, following LSH, following GNRH agonist trigger, a rapid rise within four hours, it reaches to the peak. And in next 14 hours, uh, 20 hours, it goes down. So it hardly remains for 24 hours only. Sometimes it is questioned, this short duration of LS surge is sufficient for uh, to act as a trigger? Yes, it is sufficient. At the follicular level, this LH activity is sufficient to resume, to resume the meiosis and causing all ovulatory events. Now, if you use LH, uh, SCG trigger, there is a slower rise in the SCG level, then remains longer, uh, more than two to three days, uh, the level remains high, and then gradually it comes down and takes a week. So there is a slow rise, remains level, high level, rem high level remains for a longer time, and there is a slow fall in the SCG level. So it's a long acting. Now this is again a, a important diagram. So if you here is the the LH level, here is the uh, FSH level, here is the E2, and here is the progesterone. And this level are related to SCG trigger, different agonist trigger. Uh, so if you observe the in LH level, the LH search pattern levels are similar with the all different agonist trigger and different doses. They tried all those, but the levels are same. There is a simultaneous FSH flare following agonist trigger. See, if you look at, this is FSH level. The FSH flare is only when it is agonist trigger is given, which is not with the SCG trigger. See, here is the uh, SCG trigger. There is no FSH, okay? Now, look at the progesterone. The progesterone level start rising after six to eight hours significantly. After the trigger, see, here, four hours. From here, it eight hours. From here, the progesterone start rising. And this level is more exponentially, six to eight or 10 times when SCG trigger is used. But it is less than less in the agonist trigger. And progesterone level start falling by fourth or fifth day of trigger after SCG. So after SCG, the progesterone reaches peak in two to three days. And from fourth day onwards, it starts declining. And implantation is happening at this stage, at these days, where there is a falling uh, progesterone level. And that is the reason sometimes uh, the progesterone uh, causes advancement of the endometrium, uh, sorry, SCG trigger causes advancement of the endometrium and uh, does not provide progesterone when it is actually needed. The super ovulation with the high gonadotropin and supral physiological E2 level are the ignition keys for impaired endometrial receptivity. And this high gonadotropin and supra physiological E2 level plays important role in successful implantation of embryo and complications like OHSS. So what is an effect of superovulation on receptivity? The superovulation leads to a lowering of expression of specific integrin, which plays a very crucial low role in implantation. The superovulation may also alter the timing of receptivity window. The superovulation negatively affects the genetic and immunological profile of endometrium, making it unfavorable, not only for implantation, but also for the further embryo growth and development. And supraphysiological E2 levels can modulate the endometrial gene expression profile, which leads to modification in trophoblastic invasion and possible placental dysfunction. And because of that, a lot of perinatal problems keep happening when there is a supraphysiological uh, level of E2, which commonly happens when you are doing fresh transfer. And this is translated clinically into adverse obstetric outcomes such as preeclampsia or low birth weight. 
So role of corpus luteum, what is the role of corpus luteum? We all uh, believe that primarily it is related to progesterone and estradiol. Not only that, it for a very important hormone named relaxin, which is a peptide produced by the ovary with unclear function in the early pregnancy. It is mainly produced by the large luteal cell of the corpus luteum. And of the three, the relaxin proteins, uh, uh, RLN2 is produced by the corpus luteum. And highest levels are noted in the late luteal phase and into the first trimester pregnancy. But its function is not fully understood. Possibly, uh, possible that it contributes to the process of decidulation of the endometrium and assist in suppression of the uterine contraction. Apart from that, relaxin is believed to play an important role in the prevention of PIH. In the presence of relaxin, the placental uh, or chorionic differentiation and invasion, in invasion is better and more physiological. So, in frozen embryo transfer cycle, where there is no corpus luteum, there is no relaxin, and because of that, there are more incidents of pregnancy-induced hypertension. Uh, so, why there is a luteal phase defect? The luteal phase defect may be because of the problem with the progesterone secretion, or maybe improper action of progesterone on the endometrium, or you can say receptor level problem. So why progesterone secretion is less? What is the mechanism? The defective GnRH pulse generation because of the hyperprolactinemia or obesity or androgens can lead to a defective progesterone. See, you must understand that whatever happens in the luteal phase, it is just a reflection of the follicular phase. So when there is abnormal follicular genesis, luteal phase is defective. When there is an inadequate LS surge, the progesterone is defective. When there is a small luteal cell defect, thica cell, the th thica cells are small luteal cells and granulosa cells are larger luteal cells after ovulation. So because of the defect in this, there is a luteal phase defect. So following agonist trigger, why there is a defective luteal phase in IVF cycle? The following agonist trigger, the mean luteal phase is as short as nine days. Many times we have observed that after giving agonist trigger, patient gets menses within five days, six days, seven days, eight days, nine days maximum. The serum level of progesterone and estradiol significantly lower after agonist trigger. But the corpus luteum retains the capacity to be activated by the smaller dose of SCG, that is 1,500 unit, or you can say 30 units per kg of the body weight, if that is given within four days of trigger. But still, if you have missed that train, the larger dose of SCG, that is 5,000 international unit, if it is given within seven days, it has a capability to revive the corpus luteum and corpus luteum again start uh, uh, becoming uh, active and start secreting its steroids like estrogen, progesterone, androgen, and relaxing. So, what are the why there is a defective luteal phase in the IVF cycle? It may be because of the Larger chunk of granulosa cells are removed during uh, during ovum pickup, maybe because of the inhibition of the LH release, multifollicular de following multifollicular development, supraphysiological level of steroid, or because of the negative feedback to the pituitary, maybe because of the SCG administration because suppression of LH or early exposure to progesterone, maybe because of the delayed recovery of the pituitary from agonist downregulation, especially when agonist trigger is used or long agonist protocol is used, maybe because of the antagonist driven luteolysis when there is a premature luteolysis, or maybe because of the elevated E2, because we have seen that glandular stromal dyssynchrony and endometrial advancement happens because of the elevated estrogen level. 
you must understand that good quality embryo can cover the defective endometrium due to high or low E2 level. And second thing, the natural cycle FET results are not good after failed fresh transfer following a control over in hyperstimulation as hormonal effects are carried forward. So there is a dyssynchrony following a control over in hyperstimulation cycle. Last few, uh, last few slides only. So in normal cycle, peak progesterone level is maintained at highest level. See in normal cycle, this is a normal cycle. The peak progesterone level is maintained <coughs> at highest level from cycle day six to ten, uh, six to ten days following LS surge. While after SCG trigger, the highest peak uh, of the progesterone level compared to the natural cycle achieved earlier, but starts declining also earlier from the sixth day post trigger, and which is normal, which is uh, lower than the natural cycle around eighth day post trigger, where the actual implantation is happening. See, here is the time where actually implantation is happening. So at that time, the following SCG trigger, the progesterone level is low. So after agonist uh, trigger, progesterone start declining after 72 hours of, see after agonist trigger, after 72 hours, the progesterone starts declining. So what is the role of progesterone? Briefly, the progesterone is responsible for the secretory transformation of the estrogenized endometrium for receptivity. To act progesterone, because progesterone receptors are induced by estrogen, it causes uterine relaxation. What are the mechanism? It stabilizes the lysosomal membrane, blocks the chemokines to reduce the PG synthesis, and nitric oxide synthesis. These are various mechanisms how it causes uterine relaxation. It increases the endometrial vascularity. It causes a positive shift to TH2 dominance. See TH1 dominance, there is an embryo rejection. It is a pro-inflammatory. TH2 is embryo acceptance. It is inflammatory effect. So regulation of the progesterone induced blocking factor, NKSL, HOX10, trophoblast HLA gene regulation, uh, because of the TH2 dominance. And last but not the least, the immunomodulatory action, progesterone causes immunomodulatory action to inhibit the tissue rejection and protection of the conception. Because it is, I mean, uh, it is not totally uh, homo, I mean, uh, genetic material which is not absolutely homogeneous to homologous to uh, the mother. So, rejection for to prevent the rejection, immunomodulation is needed. And this immunomodulatory action is more with uh, diadrogesterone supplementation. So, uh, progesterone is a hormone that occurs naturally in the body. It can be made in the laboratory and it is called progesterone is a general term for the substance that causes some or all biological effect of progesterone. So there are three sources of progesterone, adrenaline, ovary, and placenta. The physiological level of progesterone in women, which ranges from 0 0.23 nanogram per ml in the follicular phase to 8.3 to 25 nanogram in the luteal phase and 21 to 200 nanogram in pregnancy. In ovary, late follicular phase, ovarian origin progesterone takes over from the adrenal origin progesterone. At the initial of the cycle, uh, the adrenal uh, uh, origin progesterone is also there, but in late follicular phase, it is a primarily ovarian origin. So the source of progesterone uh, rise early in the cycle is not resolved well, similar to its management. I think this is more of management why there is a briefly if we want to discuss why there is early follicular p elevation when you call early elevation if it is more than 1.5 nanogram what are the reason 
It may be because of the incomplete luteal lysis of the previous cycle and persistent corpus luteal activity. It may be because of the aging ovary or it may be a adrenal origin progesterone. What is the effect of this? There is a suboptimal hormonal milieu for follicular growth due to, corp uh, due to corpus luteal activity. In the presence of uh, corpus luteal activity, the follicle, uh, there is suboptimal, it provides suboptimal hormonal milieu. And there is a deranged endometrial receptivity. What is the solution? Solution number one, you can delay the start of gonadotropin, or you can give antagonist pretreatment for three days before stimulation, or you can use glucostrol, glucocorticoids. All you can try, it reduces the progesterone, but really the, the, the positive effect is not translated into increasing the pregnancy rate. And ultimately, the progesterone remains elevated in the late follicular phase on the day of trigger, and there is the endometrial embryo asynchrony. So why the progesterone is elevated during the follicular phase of the stimulation? During the early follicular phase, the proje we have seen where the proje why progesterone demand, it is a originated from the, uh, the follicle growing follicle under the effect of FSH and LH. Okay, so this enzymatic conversion we have understood. So during hyperstimulation, more follicle produces more progesterone, which is beyond the capability of the CYP17 enzyme to convert the androgen. So unconverted progesterone is liberated in the circulation and which is responsible for the progesterone elevation. So what is the clinical utility of this point? The tapering the dose of gonadotropin in last two days gives enough space to CYP17 enzymatic process to convert progesterone to androgen, which keeps P level lower. The current data concludes that pre -pro premature progesterone elevation in the follicular phase is because of the persistent FSH stimulation, but it is not because of the absent LH or SCG activity. So there are a group of the people which, which strongly believes that it is nothing to do with the LH activity. It is just because of the strong stimulation and multifollicular growth. So, uh, the slide about progesterone elevation on the trigger day. So, there are different uh, studies and a lot of studies say they have got different level and different cutoff. The largest meta-analysis of 60,000 cycle by Venecia et al. 2013 concluded that more than 0.8 nanogram is associated with the negative correlation in the pregnancy achievement. So, even more than 0.8, not 1.5, more than 1.8 is also not the ideal for the fresh transfer. According to the Pepe Cola, detrimental effect of progesterone elevation subsides when transfer is delayed until the blastocyst, but which is not proven by other studies. Huang et al. in 2015 reported detrimental level for blast transfer when progesterone was elevated more than 1.75. So Huang said, Fine, Pepinicola said that blastocyst transfer is good when progesterone is elevated, but Huang proved that when it is fine till one uh, progesterone is 1.7 till 1.75. If it is more than 1.75, no, it's not good. Uh, the another, uh, the researcher eldest in, uh, uh, in 101 patients suggested that P4 0.9 or more than 0.9, no difference in the result. So 0.9 or more than 9.9 .9 is detrimental. The P4 could alter results by harming oocyte quality. And what is that level? When it was more than two, when the P4 is more than two, it affects the oocyte quality. Because so far, we all believe that when there is a progesterone elevation, it only affects the endometrial receptivity no, it is not true. If it is elevated significantly beyond two, then definitely the oocyte quality is also affected. And when such, when the embryos, frozen embryos form from such oocytes, 
are transferred later in frozen embryo transfer cycle, the results are definitely compromised. So according to new understanding, the progesterone level beyond certain level is harmful to the oocyte, not only to the endometrium. So P4 level cutoff varies with the gonadotropin preparation protocol and response to the stimulation. So women with failed IVF and ET have higher incidence of progesterone elevation. The woman with history of progesterone elevation in the previous cycle uh, uh, has six times higher odds of exhibiting progesterone elevation in the current cycle, independent of intensity, uh, intensity of ovarian stimulation. So one once Once the progesterone is elevated in the next cycle, it is likely to remain elevated. That is what they are trying to conclude. So what is a cutoff? So less than 0.9 and more than 0.5 is a cutoff. You can have little more liberty to keep it till 1.1. Never do fresh transfer when it is more than 1.75. You should, you can have more liberty if you have used HMG, if you are using antagonist protocol, if there was a hyper response, and if you intend to transfer blastosis, then you can have more liberty. What about the progesterone elevation on the trigger day and embryo quality? Uh, we have already discussed this. Now, what is the significance? This is very important. These are the last few slides, but which are practically very important. What is a significance of progesterone level 12 hours after the trigger? So the post trigger progesterone start rising and within 24 hours, it becomes five to six fold. Ideally 12 hours post trigger, the progesterone should be more than three nanogram. If that trigger has initiated LH activity. If this was more than six nanogram, it suggests early secretory transformation of the endometrium and closure of window of implantation. And it is not ideal to think about fresh transfer. When the 12 hours post trigger progesterone level is more than six. So, the P level on the trigger day, which is more than 1.7 and 12 hours after the trigger, more than 9.5 substantials reducing the implantation rate according to one study. If only 12 hours post trigger value is higher, still it reduces the implantation. So it is very crucial. Suppose on the day of trigger, your progesterone level is normal, but 12 hours post trigger, if the progesterone level is higher, still you should think twice before transferring fresh embryos. So in other words, if you really are thinking of transferring fresh embryos in your center, ideally you should measure progesterone at the early level, early cycle on the day of trigger and 12 hours after the trigger. Then and then you can have a correct decision whether to transfer the embryos fresh or freeze. What is the progesterone level when endometrium is ready in frozen embryo transfer cycle? The cutoff is one. If the, if the progesterone is more than one, there are more chances of luteinization, or you can say there are more chances of secretory transformation of the endometrium in frozen embryo transfer cycle I'm talking. So what about, again, this is very important slide. What is the significance of progesterone level on the day of ET in the FET cycle? So one third of the patients on vaginal 600 milligram per day had lower serum level. The lower P level caused hist histological delay while the higher level caused aberrant gene expression on endometrium. For vaginal administration achievement of progesterone level, uh, 22 to 31 nanogram is ideal for better implantation, which is highly dependent process on the serum level. What is 
what is the meaning of this is the ideal level is 22 through 30 nanogram serum level when you are using using a vaginal progesterone the serum level which is less than 9.2 nanogram and which is more than 125 nanogram on the day of et deserves cancellation of the transfer the intramuscular administration of the progesterone gives highest serum level and according to the study the optimum level uh, should be more than 13.6 nanogram when intramuscular progesterone level intramuscular progesterone is used uh, for secretory transformation there are a controversial conclusion regarding the serum level which is more than 20 nanogram on the day of et there are some study which says that if it is more than 20 gram the implantation is reduced Simer, there are studies which are available that uh, serum level uh, has nothing to do with the implantation as far as the progesterone is concerned in obese patient due to vast distribution of the lipophilic drug progesterone to maintain the serum level of more than 13.6 nanogram the higher starting dose of intramuscular injection is required increasing the dose of vaginal progesterone is not associated with the parallel increase in the serum level so in obese patient you should give little higher dose of progesterone and increasing the vaginal dose more than 600 milligram per day increases the pregnancy rate and reduces the abortion rate in frozen embryo transfer cycle according to one study so it is always a good idea in frozen embryo transfer cycle use higher dose more than 600 milligram per day that's one thing in obese patient better to use more dose otherwise the progesterone level if you are using little higher dose of progesterone there is no harm but if it is used in a lower dose definitely secretory transformation will be affected this is about the thyroid we all know thyroid receptors are widely expressed in reproductive tissue and thyroid hormone uh, may have impact not only to the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis but also on the implantation and early development of the blastocyst by influencing endometrial tissue proliferation and maturation so now last two slides what are the hormonal tests at the initiation of the stimulation of the ivf is needed so it is done to categorize the responder group that is amh level that decides the responder group the hormones which are done to confirm down regulations are fsh lh and e2 fsh level i have mentioned because in antagonist cycle when the basal fsh level is more than nine the cycle outcome is not good so that is why i have included fsh lh and e2 is perfectly for uh, estimation of the down regulation what are the additional tests are testosterone and progesterone for progesterone we have discussed at length why testosterone is important because testosterone is an androgen which is important for steroidogenesis and estrogen biosynthesis and it has been observed with the aging the androgen level falls and it has been observed that when it is basal testosterone is less than 20 it affects the follicular genesis and other mandatory tests are tsh and prolactin which we all do without fail what are the hormonal tests with that which we do at the mid of the cycle this is done to determine the starting of the antagonist that is it is determined by e2 the e2 should be more than 400 400 or more than 400 to start antagonist the the hormones are done at the mid of the cycle to predict ohss early how it is predicted the e2 when lead follicle more than 15 millimeter and when more than 10 follicles of more than 10 millimeter on each side when the e2 is more than 1500 it it predicts the ohs is quite early so when the lead follicle is 15 millimeter and there are multiple follicle at least 10 more than 10 millimeter follicle of more than 10 millimeter on each side then you should measure e2 level if it is more than 1500 then definitely you, you have to predict OHSS. The another uh, the idea of doing hormone level is to decide the endometrial advancement, that is progesterone on the trigger day. 
then to judge the adequacy of the scg trigger or agonist scg trigger beta scg is to be done 12 hours after the trigger which should be more than 5 unit transitional unit to judge the adequacy of the agonist trigger lh and progesterone to be done 12 hours after trigger as we mentioned the uh, progesterone should be more than 3 and ls should be more than 15 now again we do certain hormonal test for the confirmation of the pregnancy. The post ovulatory day 12, if the level are more than 30 units, it confirms the pregnancy with good prognosis. Post ovulatory day 14, if it is more than 70 unit, it confirms the good prognostic for pregnancy. The post ovulatory day, if it is more than 198 unit, it rules out biochemical pregnancy, which is important. According to one study, post ovulatory day 16, if it is more than 198, that is 200, it rules out the biochemical pregnancy. Normally, the beta SCG level doubles in 48 hours in normal growing pregnancy. Levels are little higher on FET cycles because of the improved probably presentation. The levels are lower in the pregnancy, which is likely to be biochemical or miscarriage. Values are higher in PGT embryo transfer, which implies the correlation of value with the chromosomal status of the embryos. So if, if the values are higher, either it is because of the multifetal pregnancy or good quality embryo, and that reduces the chances of abortion. The initial SCG value can predict healthy presentation and related disorders like PIH, APH, and preterm birth. So that was the end of the presentation. Now I am unmuting, and it is open for the discussion. So you can unmute yourself. Thank you, sir, for such an elaborative uh, intro to the endocrinology. Thank you. Yes. Uh, any question? You can unmute yourself. Sir, I have uh, one question. Please. Yeah, so uh, after uh, like uh, for antagonist uh, protocol that we are now using in probably most of the centers. Uh, so post. Uh, uh, Rest all, please uh, mute yourself. Yeah. So post when uh, like we your, use. Your doctor like, and this, right? Your doctor and this. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so okay. post agonist trigger that we use, uh, like you said, you should. Like, uh, should we make it a dictum to use HCG within one week to, you you know, like you said that HCG uh, uh, reduces the progesterone when exactly it is needed. So should we make yes. it a dictum like to use luprolide, uh, like lupride as a trigger and then HCG within one week of uh, uh, using the trigger? That's absolutely a fantastic idea. That's a fantastic idea. In okay. fact, if you ask me, uh, there are a lot of centers which uh, provides luteal support in the fresh cycle, hmm. uh, progesterone-free luteal support. It is called progesterone-free luteal support. So okay. they just give a SCG. They supplement with the SCG. Correct. So how they do? How they do? Hmm. So as if you, as we have seen, that following agonist trigger, the progesterone level is sufficient for next two days. And following mm -hmm. which the progesterone level falls. Correct. Uh, three days, it is sufficient for three days, and following these, mm -hmm. the uh, level falls after trigger two to three days. So, after agonist trigger, the first SCG supplementation should be done within 72 hours. After okay. agonist trigger, the first SCG supplementation should be done 
within 72 hours if it is it was a pure agonist trigger okay so roughly you can say at the time of embryo transfer if you are doing a uh, cleavage transfer okay, okay. now you. various doses how the scg can be used routinely in luteal support especially i am talking about fresh cycle okay. so one is uh, uh, providing one i mean adding 1500 to 2000 unit first dose fourth day after your agonist trigger and then every fourth day following which following the first dose so this is just sufficient to keep the corpus luteum live and Life. active okay. so this is one way second give a smaller dose so you can use a 500 international unit of scg every second day that's a second way second uh, right. method and third still if you want to be uh, pre very precise and more physiological then you can use 150 unit of scg daily after 40 starting 48 hours after the agonist trigger so right. if you just use a scg you need not add progesterone the progesterone level is well above the uh, what is required for the secretory transformation and implantation correct, correct. so uh, you can be confidently give so but uh, very few of us are courageous enough to just uh, uh, use scg as a sole luteal support okay right so when agonist trigger my suggestion or my advice to you when the agonist trigger is used either singularly or as a dual part of the dual trigger okay always supplement that luteal phase with the small addition of scg okay. and ideal as suggested by the humedan at all is first at the time of transfer 1500 unit and then every fourth day 1500 unit along with your standard progesterone supplementation right. that should be good enough to provide a good luteal support okay and is it now, that like now, we... now okay. uh, if the another way suppose if you use only agonist trigger you have to use scg trigger there is no doubt except american approach the american approach says that even if you have used agonist trigger if you in as a, in luteal phase if you supplement the cycle with the high dose of estrogen and intramuscular uh, uh, progesterone intramuscular uh, i should stop sharing huh. uh, uh, the intramuscular progesterone then that uh, rises the level of progesterone to such to a such a height that that is just sufficient to take care of uh, implantation even in agonist triggered cycle okay okay but i okay. would suggest if it was a pure agonist trigger then definitely that cycle should be supplemented with the scg now if it was the dual trigger then you can afford to give intermittent dose of scg right okay. Uh, and uh, is it like that, uh, like HCG as a trigger, uh, people say that it gives a higher chances of implantation compared to lupus, or is it not the case? SCG has got... Like if you don't suspect OHSs or if the patient is not that way, then HCG shouldn't, HCG be the only option that should be used as a trigger rather than lupus? No, 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 no. So now it is proven beyond any doubt except the case where you are suspecting OHSAs, in all other cases, it should be always a dual trigger, if it is antagonist cycle, obviously. Okay. And if it is long agonist cycle, then you don't have option. You have to use SCG trigger. But whether it is a poor responder, normal responder, your trigger should be always dual. Do not have any second thought. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. It was a very nice lecture. Thank you.
डॉक्टर अरुण पंडित डॉक्टर अरुण पंडित हेलो गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग बॉस यस सर इट वाज वेरी एक्सेलेंट लेक्चर माय क्वेश्चन इज रिलेटेड विथ एम टी पॉलिकल सिंड्रोम वन ऑफ माय पेशेंट व्हेन आई डिड ओपीयू लास्ट वीक विथ अनदर एम्ब्रोलॉजिस्ट आईवीएफ लैब आई एम यूजिंग फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम so hc trigger was given and all 10 follicles are empty follicles uh urine test in the morning done by nursing staff was showing positive so we did take for opu but mm-hmm. empty follicles were there and uh, the supervisor ivf consultant did not advise to stop the procedure and we uh, did all the uh, follicles uh, retrieved with all m2 so mm-hmm. what should have been done at that time uh, what blood test uh, should be done and stop the procedure i i mean lh levels or how should uh, i be guided by labor no, when 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 you are giving scg trigger the lh has nothing to do because you are providing uh, scg uh, for lh activity right so yes, then there is no point in measuring lh yes now when you are using scg trigger the efficacy of the scg is judged by serum progesterone level yes and bioavailability is measured by serum beta hcg level so urine pregnancy test sensitivity is around uh, you can say 20 uh, unit uh, approximately 20 unit in the urine level which is quite fallacious ideally serum level when it is more than 5 international unit 12 hours after the scg see what happens uh, the scg level gradually increases uh, when you give scg trigger it gradually increases and after 36 hour if you measure the progesterone uh, uh, there is a increasing progesterone level and there is a fall in the scg level sorry uh, uh, it is with the lh scg level should be more than 5 international unit and in any case of luteinization 12 hours post trigger may it be scg trigger may it be lh trigger the progesterone level should be more than 3 so now what are the different scenario now if you are doing om aspiration after scg trigger and uh, 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 after aspirating 5 to 6 follicle Uh, the embryologist says that there are no uh, oocyte and uh, no occ complex in the follicle so you have to stop first of all immediately then you should measure uh, the follicular fluid beta hcg level so you have to test with this uh, follicular fluid uh, your upt urine pregnancy test if that is positive that means the bioavailability of the hcg has reached to the follicle nothing wrong with the timing of the uh, scg nothing wrong with the uh, injection quality now what it's a true empty follicle syndrome so it's a true empty follicle syndrome and uh, uh, progesterone then if you measure the progesterone then immediately i send uh, the measurement of the serum progesterone level at that point of time now 12 hours post scg trigger if serum progesterone level was more than 3 and at the time of ovum pick up if the progesterone level is quite high i mean you can say uh uh say more than 9 9 10 ha uh, 9 10 then luteinization has already occurred and the activity of scg has affected but the scg has not acted on the occ complex and cumulus it is not because for ovulation or for uh, the occ to be sucked with the suction it has to be detached from the follicular wall so it has not detached from the follicular wall because of some reason and that is reason why it has occurred so really nothing can be done you can try 
repeat uh, different scg or you can give dual trigger if it was an antagonist protocol and then try after 24 hours but really that, that does not work so true mt follicle syndrome doesn't work it it is useful or something is workable when it is a uh, false mt follicle syndrome means the scg beta scg trigger. level has not reached then you can definitely if the progesterone level is also low then you can repeat the scg and you can aspirate the follicle after 36 hours, 36, not 24 hours, 36 hours. And still you can get a uh, uh, few follicles, a few oocytes, you can say. So, so in the morning, uh, urine test uh, was showing, so it was, uh, um, the trigger has worked for that trigger, reason? Bioavailability was there, missed okay. bioavailability was there. Whether trigger has worked or not, that okay. is only judged by progesterone level. Okay, okay. So, sir, uh, MD polygal syndromes are there on the rise uh, in verdict group, I have seen. So, for act all practical purpose, if uh, money is not concerned with the patient, so Ovitrel brand may be better for this purpose in most of the patients uh, so, compared to it, urinary brands. Uh, uh, the answer is yes and yes and no. Yeah, okay. answer is yes and no. Why? Because we all know the recombinant products are uh, uh, definitely uh, stability-wise superior. There is no doubt about it. Consistency-wise. Consistency-wise, there is superior and superior. there is no doubt about it. So definitely you can uh, switch over to recombinant product. But otherwise, evidence, if you look at the evidence, uh, in none, none of the way, it is superior. According to one study, uh, with recombinant SCG, the chances of OHSS is higher, in fact. And according to another very recent study, they use, they compare recombinant SCG with the urinary SCG, and they found that the implantation rate uh, and fertilization rate was better with recombinant as compared to the urinary SCG. So it is a controversial and confusing. So, but then overall, if you look at the consistency and uh, bioavailability, recombinants are better products. So yes, you can switch over if patient can afford. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, good evening, sir. I have a question. Yes, yes, please. Sir, uh, you uh, in the talk, uh, you mentioned uh, when we're giving the HCG trigger, it should be given less than 20 hours after the antagonist because the duration of uh, action is antagonist. Of antagonist is 20 hours. But you also said greater than 8 hours. Uh, that 8 hours, why, sir? No, no. I, uh, I said that in okay. antagonist cycle, if you are using agonist trigger, uh, there should be gap of uh, at least eight hours between last dose of antagonist and your agonist trigger. Because agonist has got uh, higher affinity towards GnRH receptor, it can replace the antagonist, but still uh, some hours of uh, leg period is needed. So okay. at least eight hours, if, if, if it is given within eight hours of last dose of antagonist, the effect of agonist trigger is not that good. And that's the reason gap of eight hours is needed. That is one thing. Now the half-life of antagonist is 20 hours. So mm -hmm. if the gap is more than 20 hours, there are chances of escape of pituitary and that can be uh, premature, uh, LS surge and which can spoil your game, can, can cause uh, earlier uh, uh, ovulation or it can cause advancement of the endometrium or closure of the endometrium window, anything can happen. So always uh, uh, maintain that window. The agonist trigger should be given between 8 to 20 hours of last dose of antagonist. So if you are, if you want to do the pickup, ideally, 
then antagonist should be given in the morning only so that you can give trigger comfortably in the late evening and you can do pickup in the morning so this was about the agonist trigger now as far as the scg trigger is concerned in antagonist cycle there is no such restriction because scg has nothing to do with the pituitary the scg acts directly on the l scg receptor of the granulosa cells at the follicular level at the ovarian level and it has nothing to do pituitary doesn't come into the play and that is the reason there is no such restriction as far as the scg uh, trigger is concerned in antagonist cycle i hope it has been clarified yes sir thank you so then that also means that there is no role for hcg in an ft cycle in a in a hrt ft cycle Ro 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 mutual phase. <laughs> no, uh, you are partially. Uh, no, it's you are partially wrong. Why? Why? There is a definite role of SCG in FET cycle. Why? Not because of the acting through uh, ovary, huh. because there is no follicle, so SCG is not going to. help at the ovarian level now it has been observed that there are l uh, lh receptor in the endometrium and this lh receptor plays an important role in uh, chorionic villi differentiation and this lh receptor l basically l scg receptor even scg receptor also acts on that so people the scientists researchers they tried supplementing scg in in fet cycle in two way according to one study they tried low dose of scg when there was a thin endometrium to improve the endometrial thickness and receptivity even with the thin endometrium so what has been suggested that after 8 days of study or exposure still the endometrium is thin you should give scg 150 international unit daily for 7 days it definitely increases the endometrial thickness and if, even if it does not increase the endometrial thickness definitely it, it improves the implantation so that is one way of using uh, scg or you can say role of scg in fet cycle and second the role of scg in uh, just before the embryo transfer because there are scg receptor which plays a very important role in the implantation but there are again a different controversial conclusion according to one study they say that it is a not this scg it is hyperglycosylated scg which is important which is earliest secreted by the cytotrophoblast and which is important and which plays important role in implantation now in if you give if you uh, uh, in the endometrial cavity if you inject a normal urinary scg then this scg molecule competes with this hyperglycosylated scg so that it can hamper the implantation so this is according to one conclusion according to another two conclusion uh, scg definitely helps and according to recent study recent very recent study uh, they have recommended scg when there is a repeated failure recurrent implantation failure more than two failure if you uh, if you uh, uh, inject a 500 international unit of scg just 10 minutes before your embryo transfer with the iui catheter definitely it improves implantation and pregnancy rate i have tried in couple of cases i am not too sure about uh, the increase in the success okay okay thank you thank you very much sir so just less uh, one last question uh, like you said uh, we all know that premature lh surge and the p level changes the game it it becomes a spoiler for the entire show like yes. do you have any more practical tips to how we can keep it between 0.5 to 1 or the exact range that we are hoping for in the second absolutely absolutely so that was a, a wonderful question 
So if you want to transfer the embryos fresh, uh, basically I believe in frozen embryo transfer cycle, but uh, suppose if you are believing in uh, fresh embryo transfer cycle, Correct. then what can be done if you want to keep check on the progesterone elevation? So we have understood, two things we have understood, that it is a progesterone produced from the follicle which is responsible for the progesterone elevation. So okay. if the follicles are more, or if you have bombarded with the more gonadotropin, there will be more progesterone secretion. Okay. And this CYP17 enzyme system, if it goes beyond the limit, the progesterone is liberated in the circulation and causes elevation. So one is you have to keep check on very high dose of gonadotropin because that that is uh, that which normally happens in poor responder so in poor responder you have to be very careful before transferring the embryos fresh although recent studies are suggesting that in poor responder fresh transfer uh, gives a equal result but i would advise you should uh, think twice before transferring, if you, if you, especially if you use higher dose of gonadotropin, that is one thing. Second thing, we have understood that the last late follicular recruitment, new recruitment of the follicle, mid-size follicle, which are nine to eleven millimeter follicle, which are there in the later late follicular phase, are producing progesterone, and this progesterone is just adding uh, a nuisance value because they do not harbor a mature oocytes. So you right. have to keep check on late follicular recruitment of the new follicle. So that is another. And third thing we know that LH activity, according to the sweet point theory, the LH activity right from the beginning is important because right from the beginning, uh, uh, there is a production of the progesterone and it is uh, 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 CYP17 enzyme etic system is active and it uh, immediately converts into androgen and this androgen comes back to the gonadotropin and it is converted into estrogen. So this cycle works perfectly when LH activity is provided right from the beginning. So to conclude, if you want to do a fresh transfer, the first you should not use higher dose of gonadotropin. Means your stimulation should be milder one. Okay. You should not exceed more than 225, 150 or 225, right? Okay. So first, the stimulation should be milder one. Mm -hmm. Two, you should use LH activity right from the beginning. So in other words, either use stimulate with the HMG right from okay. the beginning. Correct. Or, or mm -hmm. if you are believing in RFSS, Add small LH activity with the help of small dose of recombinant SCG. Okay. And okay. like you said, just reducing once you add an antagonist, you are relatively safe. So you can taper down the HMG dose later on in the cycle, like you said, to prevent that mid cycle. No, I'm, uh, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Okay. So okay. second okay. is adding LH activity right from the beginning. Now, what is the third thing which you can do? Third thing is to prevent the late follicular recruitment of the follicle, yes. you mm -hmm. reduce the dose of gonadotropin last two days only, not, not last two days only. Perfect, perfect, okay. Okay, and okay. fourth thing which you can do is you can double the dose of antagonist just on the last day. On the day of trigger, you can give two doses of antagonist. Okay. So. It has been noticed that mm -hmm. by doing this, the progesterone level on the day of trigger is uh, uh, is reduced. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so and E two level is momentarily reduced. So these mm -hmm. are the maneuvers which you can do for uh, reducing the progesterone uh, level on the day of trigger. And not only this, one more thing I will suggest is measuring progesterone level at the starting of the stimulation. 
and if that the starting of the stimulation progesterone level was high pretreat this cycle with the antagonist three doses of antagonist okay. and then start stimulation with the uh, your routine gonadotropin hmg baseline uh, p level what do you recommend 1.5 1.5 less than 1.5 for starting the cycle okay 1.5 less than 1.5 less than 1.5 correct sir. thank you thank you any other question hello yes yes sir dr arun pandit sir yes, yes. Uh, in sometimes if we cannot start uh, stimulation cycle and do it too can we start it in day 3 also i mean ivf stimulation see the uh, it's very nice question you do uh, saturday or sunday i mean uh, some reason yeah. see if it is a case of pcos uh, then really it does not matter whether you start uh, uh, a minute uh, Uh, can you see me yes sir yes sir okay it is okay now fine can you see me yes sir yes sir okay so if you uh, yes, if sir. it is a, if it is a pcos if it is a pcos then really it does not matter whether you start stimulation on cycle day 2 or 3 or 4 because the follicles are not yet recruited your problem starts when the follicle has been already recruited selected and then you start stimulation it is going to give asymmetrical follicle cord and when there is a asymmetrical follicle cord and if you start in the presence of asymmetrical cord stimulation the somehow cycle outcome is not good because all follicles they like to grow in cohort not in different manner asymmetrical manner so part 2 uh, of the question so to make a cohort if i get uh, time every time with the patient in previous cycle uh, should i start with uh, that uh, 21 day of the previous cycle starting of estrogen estradiol well rate and then start the cycle next time so a uh, cohort is good in almost all cases sir answer is yes and no how because see luteal e2 is a commonest uh, ah, way uh, the luteal e2 is a commonest way of uh, having a uh, uh, symmetrical cohort but still there are some patient they do not have in spite of estradiol luteal estradiol they do not have symmetrical follicular cord and that is the biggest problem so to overcome this problem the simplest solution will be once the patient suppose there is a history of asymmetrical follicular cord and second time if you are starting the stimulation better to pretreat this cycle by 3 to 5 days of antagonist lately there are there are there are there are good number of the centers who are using antagonist regularly irrespective of the poor responder hyper responder normal responder in all patient they always pre treat with the antagonist and then they start the stimulation with the gonadotropin there the rational behind this strategy is one to prevent the early recruitment of the follicle which are having highest uh, fss sensitivity and lowest fss threshold that is one and second rational if you really want to have good cohort uh, which stands true in case of poor responder then your recruitment phase should be prolonged now if you want to prolong the recruitment phase of the cycle you need to give antagonist so if you give antagonist the native fsh and lh will not be secreted so then the follicle will have internal adjustment and somehow 
uh, they uh, get used to with each other and in then after stopping antagonist when the stimulation is started it gives a good cohort so if the uh, 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 sorry uh, if uh, the economy is not a question then definitely it is a good idea to pretreat all cycle with the antagonist then your folliculogenesis and cycle behavior will be exactly same like long agonist protocol without any adverse effect of long agonist protocol so this should be in the last days of previous cycle sir no antagonist no what you are a telling is a luteal e2 antagonist protocol it is a good protocol it is a good protocol for young poor responder i am not talking about luteal e2 antagonist protocol in luteal e2 antagonist protocol after starting estradiol after two days of estradiol you give antagonist for three days and after finishing the antagonist within a day or two patient will get the menses and then if you start stimulation uh, it is likely to give little better cohort okay but genuinely if, if you want to use antagonist pre treatment for all ideally you should use in follicular phase after the menses yes. okay sir thank you sir okay. any other question so if there is no there is no question can i uh, can i uh, wrap up okay i think there is no question thank you so much for uh, being with me uh, i really enjoyed after a long time uh, so i'm ending the session with this uh, note and uh, i will update you when uh, another lecture i am planning to take is on uh, ivf stimulation protocol so i will update you uh, whenever uh, i intend to uh, deliver that talk thank you so much